Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. I've done hundreds of them now, and if this is new to you and you'd like to check out others, uh, go to batgap.com and look at the past interviews menu where you'll find all the other ones categorized in various ways. This show is made possible by the support of appreciative viewers and listeners. So if you appreciate it and would like to support it in any way, um, go to the website. There are PayPal buttons on every page. My guest today is Shakti Katarina Maggi. Um, we first heard about Shakti, I don't know, some months ago, when Zaya Benazo, who is the mother of the Science and Non-Duality Conference, got in touch with me and said, Rick, Shakti Katarina Maggi, you, <laughs> something like that. You have to interview her. <laughs> She's great. Um, so we thought, okay, so um, here we are. <laughs> Welcome, Shakti. Thank you for having me. Thank yeah. you, Rick. And it's been delightful getting to know you over the past couple of days when we've been doing little technical testing and stuff of yeah. our microphones and, and things like that. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I'll read a little bit of your bio, and but I won't read the whole thing without interspersing to ask you questions. Um, so let me start chronologically. So you, s well, first of all, you're you're obviously from you're not obviously, but I know you're from Italy. Yeah. People will get to hear the accent in a minute. You used <laughs> to be a you used to be a journalist in the financial industry world, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. 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 I was writing the last years of my journalist career. I was writing actually about uh, Wall Street. Wall Street, okay. Uh, yeah. Right. yeah. And, um, but we're going to go back farther than that. You say um, you're, that um, the first glimpses and non-definitive openings to self and the true real nature of reality began to occur for you at a very early age. Presumably yeah. you mean like, you know, five, six, seven, eight, early age yeah. like that? Yeah, yeah, like I would say around the age of uh, eight, mm -hmm. um, through a very, various, like, strange uh, circumstances that maybe is not worthy to mention, but basically I start to notice how what I was thinking and what was appearing apparently on the outer world were actually appearing simultaneously. So these are like, uh, was of course happening in the mind of a child. So like for and, example, give me an example. Uh, well, basically what happened was like, there was like a major um, situation that happened, like a shock situation because my grandfather died. Mm -hmm. And uh, like in the morning in which he actually passed away, I was with my brother uh, in the house with him. So he had an heart attack mm -hmm. and my father was uh, upstairs. And in that morning, when uh, when he actually passed, uh, that very morning, uh, he had a huge argument with my grandmother. Mm. And I was feeling like all this energy of like uh, um, disturbance of his presence in the house and everybody was angry because they had continuous, you know, arguments and things. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, um, when, when he actually died, I could see like the synchronicity of this negativity happening, mm. let's say, let's call it like that, and he's passing and like, I don't know, some way threw me in a state of like shock, you know, the mind stopped. Mm. And and the days later, uh, I like this understanding was coming up in me by itself. And I was saying, okay, let's say uh, this cannot be possibly true. Let's say mm, a red car is going to pass at the end of the road. Mm in 10 seconds and it was happening uh -huh. and more was happening and more I was getting a bit scared about it and very quiet because I never mentioned it to anybody but for me like uh, you know the death of my grandfather has been like uh, probably something that was like so strong and shocking because I was there I was I was very young I was very little and it's like uh, through my attention within it's like I noticed how everything was happening like in a kind of synchron synchronic way. Synchronistic, I think, yeah. Synchronistic, yeah, sorry. Yeah. And and this carry along for many years mm -hmm. and had another very important moment, actually all, all accident, but it's not has to be like that, but uh, I was 15 
and I sleep on a rock and uh, I bam my head mm. and I lost my memory of the last two years. Wow. Yeah, and, and so I woke up in hospital mm -hmm. and, and I realized that, you know, like everybody was living two years later <laughs> and I didn't remember anything. Uh. And, and of course, the memory came back in a very short while. But when I was like uh, mm, pondering this, I realized that I was existing beyond my memory. Mm -hmm. So I was not my story because I was there. Although I, I couldn't remember well my story, my, you know, I had um, a compression in the brain for the bruise. Mm. So it has some days to recover. There was something that was perfectly conscious and aware and had nothing to do with memories. Right. And this like was another very big like opening. Mm. And then again, you know, like I could, I mean, I could talk endlessly, many things. So it's been a kind of like a solitary uh, journey. I didn't, I didn't say to anything to anybody, but for instance, this thing that when I was 15 left me for a couple of weeks in a very big space of like a, uh, perception of a feeling how everything was actually appearing in me and was me. Uh, my senses were very open and then like the personality, I suppose, came back and it quieted down again. Yeah. But like many, 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 uh, let's say, situations, glimpses happened on the way. It's interesting that you interpreted them the way you did, you know, because most people might not have given it a second thought, but you thought, oh, this is interesting. This, this, is, this tells me something about reality that I hadn't realized. You know, you kind of <laughs> contemplated it a little bit. Yeah, it was natural for me, I would say. I was very curious. For instance, one time, uh, actually when my grandmother died, sounds very odd now, <laughs> and bring up all my family, but it's like uh, I had another thing of like, uh, realizing okay she dies she was very dear to me she dies what am i if i'm not the granddaughter of my mother mm. and what if i wouldn't be the daughter of my mother and what if i wouldn't be a person and what and what if and what if like you know everything like flicker back into nothingness yeah. and and then I panicked. I felt a huge fear of death. It was like a self-inquiry you were doing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I was 18. And yeah. I mean, I never heard about self-inquiry. It just mm -hmm. happened spontaneously. So I suppose, you know, like I, I had a very inquiring attitude mm -hmm. and uh, curious. Yeah. And, I, and once again, I didn't say anything to anybody. I mentioned it once to a friend, a friend of mine that was a psychologist. I thought, oh, sound you have the panic attack. Oh, it's very serious. And I said, really? I found it very interesting, actually. <laughs> so, anyway. Yeah. That's neat. Um, okay, so then when you were around, and just for the sake of Ooga Booga, I mean, I just have this sort of attitude or understanding or feeling that, you know, the course of evolution is, is vast and has been going on for a long time, and that, you know, the whole reincarnation notion and, and that people who sort of come in as a child with all sorts of experiences and insights probably had already evolved to a great extent before this life and they're picking up where they left off uh, that's my take on it that's what a lot of the you know bhagavad gita and things like that say but it, it's a possible explanation of why so many people i interview relate having had experiences like yours when they were very young whereas i don't think that's normally typical of the general public yeah i mean um I have my view on reincarnation, uh -huh. but Maybe I don't we'll know. Maybe we'll get into it later. <laughs> yeah, later. Yeah, but like, like uh, I would say that something. It was something that was not happening when um, a feeling from my side that was something spiritual. I mean, I was grow up in a Christian family, mm -hmm. and I had this very deep love for God since I was a kid. Nobody told me to go to church or to pray, but I was actually in a. Um, uh, and I love fish in my work and just go to the church and say the rosary or just saying there's something. I really like it. Yeah. And it was not an obligation. Uh, it was really like, a, I mean, now I could say I was meditating, you know, but at that time there was no um, ideas in me about it. Yeah, it just I came naturally. Like, I never look at awakening. I never like, you know, intentionally seek for anything. Sure. I was inquiring myself that's it yeah you're just kind of wired that way from a young age yeah 
Yeah, so then you say around 27, age 27, these, you say these temporary windows of our true nature brought you to a state of great inner openness without having the cognition that what was happening was called awakening or enlightenment or in, in other cultures. So, so what happened when you were 27? Well, uh, I would say that in the period, an hour, a year and a half, two years before that happening, there has been a kind of like um, disenchantment with the word, a disenchantment with my work. I've been putting a lot of energy in my work, mm -hmm. and I realized that like, like, was not it, and so I was all my attention was back on me, mm -hmm. and uh, after like a, a love delusion. I was like simply staying there, feeling this deep sense of love with no object. And I was thinking, oh, I really would wish to have somebody to give this love to. And then I thought, if if this love is here, it has nothing to do with the other person. It's here. It's me. And I fell asleep in this recognition to be love that all my life I was like uh, trying to express and to touch and to reach. And then around two in the morning, uh, I woke up with all my body shaking. All the cells of my body were like sinking in bliss and expanding mm. in waves of love. And I was sure I was going to die. I was pretty, I mean, I even sent a text to a guy that uh, was my ex-boyfriend and say, I forgive you, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I was, certain like it was yeah. really strong and then when i woke up in the morning everything disappeared mm. and when everything appeared in the morning i was surprised to be alive mm. and i had this i called a friend and said you know it's strange it's like there is a huge boundless me an i with no you know with no limits it is watching this small character that is like a cartoon mm -hmm. and since that was like watching life like with much less sense of reality and big openness. And it's when, like, you know, after this big thing, is when I realized I needed a guide. Hmm. Because for the first time, I realized I needed somebody explaining to me what, what's you know, yeah. what's going on. <laughs> and But I say, okay, if all this happened by itself, I don't need to look for anybody. Like, you will show up or she will show up. I have, like, life is going to bring me the guide I need. So constantly there was this sense of like openness and faith, let's say, you know, in me that, you know, God was, you know, looking after me. You know, at that time there was still this, of course, not complete understanding. And, and that's it. Yeah. That's how I met my guide, basically. It's interesting, like the, the biggest awakening I ever had was during sleep also. And mm. it, was, it was very profound. I'm not going to talk about it now because it's not, it's your interview, but it I wonder how how often that happens to people, you know, where you know, during sleep something really profound happens. It makes sense because uh, if you are in a state, when it happened here, was the body, body was not asleep, but like uh, I woke up, you know. Yeah. The moment in which you are going to sleep and the moment in which you are waking up are a twilight zone yes. in which you have filled up completely your sense of me. So, uh, it's quite easy in that period, and that's why, in a sense, in many traditions, there is this idea of meditating the early hour of the morning or mm -hmm. before going to bed, in a sense, to align the form, you know, towards the self. Yeah. And so this is the reason. I mean, it, you're not alone. Many, many people have major insights before going to sleep, or they wake up during the night, maybe going through some strong energetic process. Mm -hmm. And for some people, it's actually quite scary. Hmm. It can be scary. Especially if they don't know what's happening. Exactly. Yeah, right. yeah. I think I was a weirdo. I was not worried. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I, yeah. I was I was felt I was really feeling that I was held by God. Right. That's you know why I wasn't uh, afraid. Yeah. I think kind of sounds like you had cultured that faith or that understanding in yourself already throughout your life. So, you know, it's different than if somebody hadn't done that. You were just surrendered to a, to a great extent. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I yeah. was uh, it was just happening spontaneously. But until I met my guy, that was three months later, mm -hmm. this uh, bigger, bigger, uh, say, opening up. Yeah. Uh, I never even heard the word alignment or awakening. Yeah. I have no idea that people were looking for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I knew people were meditating, 
but it, it like why or something. I, I, I never really. Yeah, I haven't I, thought about it. You know, at yeah. all. Yeah. It's interesting in the in the Vedic tradition they talk of there's this word Turiya which you've probably heard of which means fourth, right? And um, it's called fourth because waking, dreaming, and sleeping are considered to be the first three or the the other three. And it's it's thought that between each of those three states, waking, dreaming, and sleeping, there is a gap as one transitions from one state to the other. And in in that gap, one can experience the fourth or Turiya, and that over time as one evolves the it, the gap gets wider or clearer um, and eventually Turiya or the fourth state is experienced continuously 24 7 along with waking dreaming or sleeping but it's most likely that it's first going to show up as one transitions from one of those three states to the other yeah i mean like Turiya, in my understanding is simply the background of everything is yeah. the empty awareness mm -hmm. and like when you actually pass from a state of consciousness to the other there is the possibility to see how everything is unreal right yeah. so if something is changing it can be solid uh when when still i was inquiring like um, around my 20s i was sometimes asking myself what am I when I'm not the, the girlfriend of somebody or the journalist? What, what am I in between things when I change my clothes, mm. you know, like my, my masks? What am I in between these two uh, appearances? So it was something that was happening very spontaneously and can happen to anybody. I mean, in a sense, you know, I'm the little proof that this can happen to anybody yeah. and because it belongs to human nature it doesn't belong to seekers mm -hmm. uh, seek, see, conscious seekers express it but it belongs to human nature it belongs to everybody sure <clears throat> and you might extend it to say well what am i if my arm gets cut off or if my body dies you know what what am i yeah, yeah. of course yeah <laughs> yeah i mean like uh, in a sense it's only when we you see that like all these uh, you don't belong to what appears right. but what appears belongs to you mm. that you can love life fully you know yeah until until you think you belong to the body or to the mind or to your story or to what appears in your life then you remain attached to it and you feel imprisoned and encaged mm -hmm. where instead when like your relation comes back on, on the true you, then you see that everything belongs to you. And there is this sense of freedom, but at the same time of deep love, really, for everything. Yeah, so you alluded to your teacher a couple of times, and we could maybe we could talk about him now. Um, so you had this awakening experience, and then about four months later, you, you met your teacher. Is that, yeah. be, is that because you realized, I think you said you sort of needed one, but you expected the person to just show up when the time yeah. was right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like after this uh, bigger event, I realized that for me it was needed a, a teacher, but I didn't look for it. Right. I said, okay, life will bring it to me, mm -hmm. and I wait. And when I, like, really by chance, let's say, I was called by a friend to go to a satsang, mm -hmm. and at the time I didn't even know what a satsang was, just sat there, and this guy that was a Bodhyavasa was uh, actually in that moment talking about uh, his own first awakening mm. and i said okay that's what happened to me mm. and and literally five days later like i realized that katerina never existed mm -hmm. that was uh, my own imagination and all this was a movement of my own being mm. uh, at that time i wasn't able to express it uh, as now because it's not been integrated but this recognition has been like a uh, um, steady in the sense that after that moment I never felt to be a person again I never like identified with the me the me came back big time of course but I never I never bought it I never um, it believed didn't, it. it didn't predominate no never yeah. like and and I don't know like maybe this is a bit uh, uh, unusual and I suppose it's because I had this like opening since I was very very young and, and so I was already like, uh, in a sense, in, without knowing it, in a state of balancing on this. Yeah. Well, he said the majority of people I met for the majority of forms, let's say, consciousness opens up and then there is a period of like a pendulum of the mind in which like 
you fall back into identification, and then again you see your openness, and you have to see that this movement happens in you, as you. Mm. Like, yeah, I went through that for a number of years before that big experience that I told you about, and and the, when you fall back into the identification, it was it was always so painful that I would feel all day long. I would feel I can't wait to go to sleep at night, where where I can just blot it, blot this out, and not feel this anymore. Uh, yeah, you know. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, because because that moment it can be really like a, a painful because very painful. At, at that point, you see, you know, the grass on the other side of the hill is greener. And you know that there is a space of freedom and and joy, unconditional, and and you seem to be doomed again in the patterns of identification. Yeah. And it requires understanding to see that that those patterns happened, but they don't happen to you. They do happen in you, mm -hmm. and they are part of basically, in a sense, I would say consciousness, like uh, being able to welcome all its manifestation but for a period you fall back in this idea so these patterns are not actually free to come to the surface of consciousness fully because in my understanding is actually after awakening that you start to have this purification big time mm. before then the sense of identification with me uh, prevents the full uh, uh, surfacing of certain patterns because there is always a me that to which all this is happening to. Yeah. Where we said after awakening, like that's why for me, awakening is the beginning of the journey. Awakening is as the moment in which your attention comes back to emptiness. That is the moment in which the purification and integration and embodiment of awakening can happen. Or because can, or can accelerate anyway. It's, yeah. It's like beforehand. It's like, well, there has to be some purification beforehand, too, in order, because the vessel's being prepared, you know, to, to experience consciousness or, or to awaken the consciousness. Uh, but it's still like a little cup of water where you can't really dissolve too much mud in it without muddying up the water. But then once the, the cup kind of breaks, then you could take whole shovelfuls and throw it in and it can dissolve. So the, the ability, to, the capacity to process or, you know, resolve all this identification and conditioning gets much greater, right? After yeah, awakening. because yeah, because taking your analogy of the cup, the cup is the me. Right. If you are the ocean, it doesn't matter how many drops fall into you or yeah. how much currents are moving or, or how, how much, much mud pain. you throw in or whatever. It doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that you don't feel the emotions or the sensation that those patterns are involving. Of yeah. course, you feel them big time because you feel them for the first time really, you know, full force, right. as you say. But because there is still this hook on believing to be a person, it's still marginal. Something is happening, of course, but it's not yeah. really like the real process, in my understanding, happens when you really stand in the in the emptiness and from emptiness you watch all the layers of personality coming up and then you integrate them on yeah. any level of your being. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree. The capacity to process it, it becomes much greater because you have a solid foundation. You know, otherwise, yeah. otherwise you get blown off by every little thing. Otherwise you get scared yeah. and, you, and you say, oh, what, what is happening to me? Oh, I should fix my way of thinking or should fix my personality. I, ch I must change this in order for to avoid something that it looks always bigger than you. Yeah. You know, when when you stand in emptiness, there is nothing bigger than you. You, <laughs> you know, so you can you can and and this. I don't want to give the impression. You know, like this is something in my experience, at least. You know, waking up to seeing that you are really nothing, it's very easy. It doesn't. Add, it's it's easy and it's natural. You know, just watch back what is watching this moment, and you find just empty awareness, not a person. Mm -hmm. The person is. A sense in you. So, um, the real adventure, in a sense, in my experience, is meeting yourself in the manifestation. Yeah. This is. So that what you just said. This I can get about three questions out of what you just said. Um, one is uh, watching back or looking back and seeing the emptiness. Um, are you implying? Hope you're not implying that this is well. Maybe maybe this would be a legitimate thing to do. That this is something one would consciously, intentionally do as a sort of practice, 
or would you say no. that at a certain point this becomes second nature and you don't have to think about it or do anything, it's just the way you operate? Yeah. Um, you see, we, we have to remember that all this is not happening to the person, right. but it's consciousness waking up. Right. So the consciousness waking up has, as a side effect, a change in the person. Mm -hmm. But it's not the person that now has to watch things from, you know, from the emptiness. I am emptiness. Right. I am, I am the emptiness. So I'm watching my own creation here. Yeah, the appealing. person can't do emptiness. It's like empty, no. emptiness is itself. No, yeah. exactly. And, and in a sense, I was talking about this with a friend earlier this morning. In a sense, when you see really that you're not in charge of your spiritual life, but you know, is that you are done by life, uh, can be a moment in which you get a bit scared. You say, oh my God, all my efforts, all my commitments, all the things I've done. But those things were done as, as a, an appearance of a deeper movement in consciousness. You know, our going to satsang, our watching videos, interviews, our inquiry as a form is the manifestation of, of this consciousness, empty consciousness, wanting to meet itself. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it's consciousness that is when meets itself then start to uh, welcome everything that is appearing as a manifestation of itself and and these on the surface of life appears as if a person is integrating these and embodying that and is going through that process and is letting go of the touch to the thing but actually what is really happening is that that appearance is the final representation of something much deeper. When I say I, I never refer to the person. I always refer to, to awareness, to consciousness. And when I speak with people, I always address that in them. I don't address uh, their idea of themselves. Yeah, but I mean, if you're sitting eating dinner with somebody and you say, I would like some more mashed potatoes, please. You're, you're not saying consciousness wants more mashed potatoes. No, you're, you're saying your no. body would like some. <laughs> of course, I say, I say, oh, I fancy more potatoes. Will you pa pass it to me? Of course, like yeah. our everyday language. Normal, normal language, yeah. Of course, of course. <laughs> it makes no sense. Actually, like it's so weird when people speak of themselves in third person. Know, you it's know, it's annoying. It's annoying because, in a sense, it's like it's really a mental thing in which you have to remember. Like I don't remember anything. But like I know, you know, when like when a pardon, like some leftover of residual ego comes up, I know there are just it's just things, just just waves of the ocean. So, and I know in a sense that all these, you know, and 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 Rick and Shakti and the computer and the interview is all a manifestation that is happening in me. Mm -hmm. And and dancing, you know, since that you mentioned it, I really like to to stress out this dancing between existence and non-existence, like seeing that everything is an illusion and at the same time giving to it a tremendous importance because it's happening just now and is a miracle. You know, the balance between these two things, you know, asking the potatoes, knowing that it's all a dream and yet enjoying the potato, you know, enjoying the taste of it. Sure. And, you know, and the balance between these two things, I think is very important because otherwise, you know, we often spiritual bypass life for hiding from life, really. Yeah. I would say. Nisargadatta said that the ability to appreciate paradox and ambiguity is a earmark of, of more spiritual maturity. You know, the, yeah. yeah, the paradox. <laughs> I mean, and some people don't get the paradox thing. They just emphasize one side of it. You know, the, there are no potatoes. There is no dinner. There is no body and blah, blah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, from my point of view, how delicious it is that I am a limitless being and I'm experiencing myself to this limited body and maybe an experience that is so, you know, finite. And yet, you know, if I bring it back here, it's endless. I mean, it's, that's the miracle of being human. Fascinating, huh? Absolutely. And it's the meeting point. I think many people miss that the reward is being human and living life as it is. That's the reward. Yeah. You know, if, if you stand in, your, in, the, in the eternal being, you can appreciate finally impermanency and life. And you, so, you sometimes find that even the more intense experiences are, are the most fascinating because they, 
because of the contrast between it being and the intensity of the experience you're having. I, I'm not sure I have understood this, what you mean. Well, like, I don't know, if you're going through something that is a little bit more crazy than usual, like I don't yeah. know, you're running through an airport trying to catch a plane or something, and, and it's kind yeah. of, it's fascinating because there's this pure silence and nothing is happening, and yet oh, you're right. running down the hall trying to catch the plane, yeah. you know, it's yeah, like, yeah, isn't yeah, that I, amusing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I understood now. Yeah, because you catch the drama, and in a sense, like, you learn how to play it as if it's real. Yeah, and yeah. You, and do everything, you know, full force, you know, and something in the background knows that it doesn't really matter. And, and this is the deliciousness, the delightfulness that I was speaking about before, is the delightfulness of being human. You know, this, the human is a bridge between manifestation and what is always unmanifest, is the center point of the cross. And that, that part, you know, verticality of being and infinite manifestation is is you know is you yeah. <laughs> it's it's the, the, it's the adventure of being human and it's it's totally fascinating and is the reason why we are here you know yeah i was so, listening to something i think it was one of your talks i listened to about six hours of your talks um this past week and um there was a woman who was somehow i think if i can remember this correctly she was talking about she hadn't totally resolved this issue that we're talking about right now. She was talking about aspirations and, and having aspirations or not being able to fulfill aspirations. And it reminded me of a verse in the Gita, which, which is that, you know, you, you have control over action alone, but never over its fruits, you know, so you just don't, don't live for the fruits of action. So, and, and, you know, that is to say that you can be established in being and have act motivations and desires and intentions and aspirations and, of and all those things. But if they don't work out, it's like, oh, right, the divine has a different idea for me. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, um, it, it can sound a kind of contradictory or weird if you don't watch it from from emptiness, but you watch it from the idea to be a person right. to see how you can get engaged with life you know, full force and really like uh, being, you know, passionate about things yeah. and, and being detached at the same time. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, when we were kids, we were living like that. You know, I do sometimes this example for me is right, really like clear, you know, when like we were like on, you know, uh, on the shoreline mm -hmm. building up a sand castle and we were totally passionate, like doing the door and doing all the castle and doing everything so precise. And we knew that the sea was going to destroy it. And we fought with the sea, but at the same time, was okay, you know, was okay. That was just a, was just a game. You know, the, the fun of life, the delightfulness of life comes from seeing that it's all impermanent. And if you stay, as I said before, in this thin line between seeing that everything is an illusion and watching the wonderfulness of life and like from the emptiness of you and your form, that center of the cross, that where there is the, this heart that is open and inflamed, that, that is the door, you know, yeah. to understanding that um, you are here to meet life, you are here to play your part as a form, to become yourself as a form, steady in the recognition that you are, emptiness, silence, that you are free. Mm -hmm. I don't know if all kids are as dispassionate as you just said. I mean, kids going through the supermarket and the, sitting in the shopping cart sees a candy bar. Mom, I want the candy bar. Mom, no, you can't have the candy bar. And there's all this screaming. And But then what happens is five minutes later, the kid's forgotten all about not being able to get the candy bar. So, yeah. you know, there's an initial yeah. sort of resentment to not getting the desire fulfilled, but they usually move on more quickly than many adults yeah. do. Because they don't stay in the horizontal mind, they don't stay in the story, yeah. they leave everything vertically. That's what I was trying to express before when I say the cross, is like meeting the, the horizontal display of life that is space and time from the verticality of the moment mm -hmm. and meeting it and meeting it. Everything is like so intense and real in the moment in which it happens and then disappear. And you meet it and it disappear and you meet it and it disappear. And, and this, you know, Filling yourself with the manifestation and emptying yourself out of it. It's the joy, it's the pulsation of life, actually. Nice. And kids do this naturally, but when we grow up, we tend to remain attached to our story. So we remember about the candy bar 
10 years later and we speak maybe with our analyst about yeah you know, my mom was so cruel she wouldn't let me have the candy bar <laughs> yeah and, I, and and maybe you know like putting things that are not even there sometimes yeah uh, i say this you know i have great respect for therapy because sometimes it's very useful to come to terms with things and i'm not against it at all but i can see that for what matters spirituality it's not a of any use actually because it speaks about the me. Mm. Although sometimes a messed up me has impediments for spiritual development that a, a little bit more healthy me might not have. Would you agree? Mm, yes and no. In a sense that uh, I agree that might be more difficult to be somebody, you know, if that somebody has heavy conditioning, but in a sense that heaviness might be a tremendous trigger and pull. It's true. For, for you know, seek for, I, I saw people really, really struggling in their life, so open to listen to this message because in a sense they say, okay, this finally makes sense. And other people that were more like functional, you know, like, uh, and having a more like a uh, functioning life, more, you know, asleep in their comfort zone. Very true. And, because their life works. So I would say that there is a justice, there is a balance in everything. Yeah, I think that was my experience. I mean, I was 18 years old, high school dropout, getting arrested, you know, just wow. difficult times. And when I finally learned meditation, it was like, holy mackerel, this is really <laughs> what I needed. And I, so I stuck to it like glue, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, like, I mean, like every we have to remember that there is no, as we said before, a person looking for truth. It's actually truth that is looking through us. Yeah. So truth that it's us, it's our true nature, is looking for itself anywhere. And, and sometimes people that have a bit of like a bumpy road, you know, are people that have a tremendous uh, natural passion for life and, the, and for truth and they want to know it and they disobey maybe the rules, you know. There is a beautiful expression of, of Osho that used to say, only rebels reach God. Mm. That I, I quite agree. Uh, you, you have to be a rebel to go against the idea to be a persona, you know, and remain insane in it. <laughs> and, and, and something, you know, it's something that I would say, you know, this is something that really is very important for me. I really believe that this message is not only for seekers, it's for everybody. Sure. Really, everybody's looking for this. Mm -hmm. even if they don't know it. If you can remember it, you can address the true being in anybody and not a person, you know, and maybe not have like that snobbery, oh, I'm a seeker, you know, I know better than you. Yeah. And actually listening to people, you know, and say, wow, let's watch what truth is doing there. Mm. How interesting. Did you ever see the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind by Steven Spielberg? Yeah. Yeah. So that was like a beautiful metaphor for what you're saying, where he had this experience and then it was implanted in him that there is this thing and I need to find it. And then he went back into his normal life and he couldn't relate to it. And it was like, I'm, hey, what is this thing? He was taking, speaking of potatoes, he was taking his mashed potatoes and forming them into a mountain. And he was, you know, building that thing in the living room, doing all this stuff because he was driven by this sense that there was this thing that I need to find, you know, and, it, he, and everybody was telling him he was crazy and his wife was opposing him. And finally, he just like, you know, cut out and, and went and found it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like sometimes like we, if we watch the life of people from this point of view, we see there's something way bigger than looking for a girlfriend or looking for a job or looking for approval. What is actually driving our life is truth, yeah. even when we don't know it. So if we watch this, we see that in a sense, everybody in their own merry way or unmerry way sometimes are actually, you know, coming to rest in this. And some expression of, of, of some forms seem never to fulfill this, but in my perspective, actually they are exploring dualities and polarities in a way that will make a consciousness more ready to encompass it another time, in another form. Nothing is lost. Even our mistakes and errors yeah. are perfect. I mean, it's not a person awakening. Consciousness is awakening through all its forms. So, in certain forms comes to full recognition, in certain forms seems to be asleep, but in that remaining asleep is actually knowing those polarities and meeting those polarities and making that knowing available for all consciousness. 
I don't know if I'm able to put in words what I'm trying to say. I think you're saying it I'm beautifully. I, I totally get what you're saying, and I think the listeners will too. And you and I were talking the other day, and we were saying how this is basically what's driving the entire universe. I mean, not only we, the forms, the human forms on this planet, but the whole thing has this sort of deep evolutionary drive at its core, which is evolving and evolving and evolving all of its expressions to greater and greater, greater capability to um, awaken to their true nature. Yeah, it's, a, it's an endless recognition. This, this waking, is a waking up, is not something that happened in time once to a person and then, no, this is something that happens through the eons, mm -hmm. through the centuries, through all the forms, through all sentient and non-sentient beings. Awake, uh, like awareness is waking up. Yeah. And we as forms are the glory of it. <laughs> you see, like uh, when really, you know, watching the manifestation from this recognition it's something that really make you appreciate life. It's so precious. You hate impermanency before then. You hate the people, you know, change and die and go away. When you watch it from this, you say, wow, it's so incredible. We are eternal and we experience death. Wow, we experience change. You know, this is something really that, you know, make you appreciate life and love life as it is. That to me, you know, is, is the reason why we're here. Like, yeah. Now, it doesn't always make sense to try to fit cosmic purposes into human understanding. <laughs> but, but if you were to try to give an explanation as to why consciousness is doing this, you know, why is there a universe? Why, why do all the forms in the universe appear to be evolving? What would you say? I would say that we all sense that there is something, even people that are atheists, they do sense atheist, that there is, yeah. atheist, sorry, mm -hmm. there is something that is, you know, behind the sense of me. Mm. And it's knowing life and is our true self. And when, you know, like we meet the duality of life, the polarities of life, good, bad, right, wrong, male, you know, we get so fascinated with that polarity that we end up to trying to hold on to a side or another or to the excruciating pain of having to decide one or the other. And that pain and that apparent, let's say, uh, losing yourself in the polarities that makes sometimes your life quite miserable is actually the only way in which this knowing self that is on the background can meet those polarities. So this means that your mistakes and your errors and your bends, ups and downs in life are not unnecessary suffering, are not like God is like a mad scientist that put <laughs> there its rats and plays, you know, oh, yeah. let's see what they do, you know. Yeah. God is, is, is a scientist that is so madly in love with his own experiment that he entered in the experiment as if it's one of the creature of the experiment. So we are at the same time the mouse and the scientist. Right. And this is the incredible thing. So also all, all, even when you lose yourself in those polarities, this is the only way in which you know consciousness can know that. Yeah. Beautiful. And, and as a yeah. living reality. Exactly. And right. and these and these allow you to see your life doesn't matter how long is your life. It might be very short or very long, you know. Wow, I had that experience. Experience yeah. that, you know, like it's precious. When when we fight with life, we don't see it, but we, we face with death, you know, people, for instance, that know they're going to die very soon. Even if they are, they are in a miserable situation, they really appreciate life as it is. And they are great teachers, great masters, and, and people that, you know, are you know, their life bring them to, to assist them. They really see this. When we fight with life, we don't see the beauty mm. because we want eternity from it. If we rest where true eternity is, then we can love life. Beautiful. Well put. Thank good you. To see, you must have been a very good journalist. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you have I a way with words and English isn't even your native language. Uh, uh, well, I, I think I think life chose this form because it's good in communicating. Yeah, yeah. And 
and and because otherwise, you know, uh, to be honest, it's quite, you know, you know, it's the last thing I would think I've done, you know, I would have done in my life is like sitting in spiritual centers on, you know, the majority of people know about, you know, Vedan things way more than me. And of course, in these years, I've been reading things and I'm interested in knowing and, and gaining more knowledge because I think that knowledge is important to make bridge with people. But like, was the last thing, you know, that I thought I would have been doing. Right. <laughs> They didn't train you for it in journalism school, but yet they did. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. To use your analogy then, just to wrap up that point, um, you know, it's as if the scientist says, well, I think I will become a mouse, but I'll also remain the scientist. And as a mouse, I'll forget that I'm the scientist, but I want to do that for the sake of the, the play of this situation here. And yeah. then I, as a mouse, I need to sort of somehow wake up to the fact that I'm really the scientist. Yeah, I mean, like, think about it, you know, if you want to make the game really nice, would you want to know that you are the scientist since the beginning? Or would you prefer to discover that on the way, putting some clues there? Yeah, it's more, you know, the, the term Leela, meaning play, and it's sometimes said that the whole creation is the play of, of the divine, you know, Leela Shakti. And uh, it wouldn't be so much of a play if you were constantly aware from, from the outset that it was only a game. You know, it's, yeah. it's more of a game. If you, it's like when you, when you go to watch a movie, you kind of want to put in the background the, the knowledge that this is only a movie and really get into yeah. it to enjoy it. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, like, the game is that you think you're locked inside a little form and then you discover you're not. And when you discover you're not, you finally enjoy the labyrinth. And like, to me, it's fascinating. It's yeah. it's really, really, really beautiful. And I hope uh, like these words give uh, um, some sense to who might listen to it, that their life is not, you know, doesn't have to go in a certain direction. The direction in which it's going is perfect. Is the direction that, you know, is the best for you to see what you are. Yeah. It's, give relief. You know, that's, there's a beautiful old story. Um, I'll, make, I'll tell it really quick just because it fits in here. Give your voice yeah. a rest for a second. So there was this king and he had a chief minister who was his constant advisor. And the minister was very wise and, and people would come to him with problems all the time. And he would always say, well, everything God does is for the best. And, you know, someone would come and say, my baby died. And he said, well, everything God does is for the best. And a lot of people came to resent that after a while. So they, they, they decided to set a trap for the minister. So... Um, the king happened to have his finger cut one day when he was having a manicure or something. And so they brought the news to the chief minister and, and he said, nah, everything God does is for the best. So they went back to the king and the king was furious. Oh, how could this be for the best that I cut my finger? Throw him in jail. So they threw the minister in jail. And then the king went out on a hunting party and he uh, ran into some aboriginals who captured him and were going to use him for a human sacrifice. But when they were preparing to do that, they discovered he had this cut on his finger and he was therefore unfit for sacrifice. So the king realized at that moment, oh, God, everything God does is for the best. I, gotta, I feel so bad now. I threw my minister in jail. I got to go back and apologize. So he went back to let the minister out of jail. He said, oh, I'm so sorry. And the minister said, are you kidding? He said, if, if I hadn't been in jail, I would have gone with you. And I didn't have a cut on my finger. They would have killed me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. Like, it reminds me of that Zen story they say is uh, of like uh, the farmer that had this broken leg. Oh and yeah, then, that's a good one. You know, you're like maybe, maybe is it good? Maybe yes, maybe not. Yeah, I mean life is an amazing adventure. I, I, I like to go to sleep, you know, to be honest, every every night and thinking, wow, if this is my last day. Wow, thank you, life. Mm. I, I tend, I tend to try to live life like this, you nice. know. Uh, to to really to put my heart in what I do every moment and, yeah and play the game you know and and, I, and if uh, mistakes or errors appears or apparent mistakes and errors appears they are part of the learning curve and I understand that like you know you know some people think that those moments of crisis those moments of darkness are something to avoid to finally arrive to light mm -hmm. where instead is more about the light of our being meeting the darkness and dissolving it mm. and, and discovering the beauty of it you know meeting our humanity from our divinity Be that's it this is 
not, not like as, as a person looking for God, but as the divine making experience of being human to us and, and meeting those dark moments as, as part of our creation. They are our creatures, our son and daughters. So would it be, in light of what you just said, would it be true to say that if you try to avoid those dark moments or hide out from them or medicate yourself in some way, then you're depriving the divine of the opportunity to clear them up? Yeah, I mean, like this could be brought to an extreme that is not, of course, my intention. It's not that you have to have a miserable life so, you know, consciousness can have, right. you know, more knowledge. It's about like seeing how life in its ups and downs, its sole part of our embodying and meeting and integrating ourselves in a manifestation and see the beauty is bliss in this, in meeting life as it is. Yeah. So when, when you have dark moment, of course, like the body, the form is made for pleasure. Like the body looks for pleasure. It doesn't look pain, no. you know, you have to be a, a perverted mind to look for pain. So uh, naturally the body, you know, if you go for the needle, I do like this, you know, or with a flame. So the, cre the creature, the form, looks for uh, for something that is pleasurable and nice. At the same time, the emptiness that is watching that, if pleasure doesn't happen, but pain happens, can meet the depth of pain, can meet the, you know, the sweet poignancy of sadness, the fire of anger. You can meet yourself fully when, you know, when you don't avoid a part, because the suffering is in the avoidance. It's not in the life itself. Yeah, in, in one of your articles on your website, you, you, it was about the disappointment of love. You said, the quest for love can go on for a long time. If you're lucky, it disappoints you quickly. If you're lucky, <laughs> your heart breaks. And when it breaks, the expectation that love comes from the other will be disappointed. The more this disappointment happens, the more your heart opens. The more your heart opens, the more you open to love. Yeah. I mean, your, your heart are really to get broken open for you to see that... Uh, you are the love that you are looking for. Mm. And, and, and it doesn't mean that it happens to suffering. It can happen also to falling in love. You know, when you fall in love, when, when you see yourself in another person, the, the boundaries of the me get expanded. And, and the place in which you are expanding is actually silence. But if you would expand endlessly, probably would meet the fear of dying in that love. So in the majority of cases, difficulties or obstacles seems to appear, arguments, breaking apart, because it's too much that love. So it's not that it's forcefully in a negative way, let's say that our heart get open, it can also get open simply loving people. But uh, I would say that if there is any resistance, this resistance must be disowned. And sometimes life takes care of it, like bringing the beloved away or like, uh, giving some, um, you know, disillusion, some situation that uh, make you feel uh, sad. Mm -hmm. And if you can let that open up completely without avoiding sadness or pain or loneliness, then you know what love is. You mentioned forgiving a boyfriend, an old boyfriend, when you thought you were going to die. And you also mentioned that you have a boyfriend now. How, have, oh, yeah. how has awakening affected your relationships? <laughs> uh, I mean... It's strange in a sense, because of course, the way in which I live a relationship now is not the way in which I, I live a relationship at that time, right. because I really see that it's impersonal. And, and the fact that, that uh, you know, like uh, my boyfriend is with me since now seven years, that is a long time, is a miracle. <laughs> you know, it's a miracle that we meet every day, it's a miracle that we choose every day to be together. Nothing is given for granted. And there is a great respect and, and there is the seeing that I am what is living in both forms, in all forms. So my love, you know, is, is, is impersonal, is for everything, but my form likes to stay with this form. And it's, it's so delightful, you know, again, paradox, I would say before, it's so delightful, this paradox of, you know, the form liking to be with one person, not because it's forced to, but because it's really love that person. And, you know, chooses that person every day. So, yeah, it's, it's you know, I would say that it's uh, a gray mirror, you know, if you, if you have a relationship, even if you don't have a relationship, 
other people, you know, like the supposed other people are the way in which we integrate what we think we are not. So the other is the one that you're going to be if you meet them in yourself. And it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful play. I'm really grateful. I, I mean, say this, it could, you know, it could end up today, you know, and or it might die or might, I might die, you know, today, who knows? I don't live, you know, with the idea that everything lasts forever. I don't give things for granted. That's nice. Yeah. <clears throat> um, a while back towards the beginning of this interview, you, you talked about when you had this awakening and you said for several days there was no sense of a me, but then the sense of a me came back. Um, yeah. Do, do you still have a sense of a me in some respect? Um, I have to say, just, just chronologically to understand, mm -hmm. that moment that you refer to has been a first like clear opening up, yeah. but I would say that the real waking up happened when I met my teacher, you know, five days mm. later I met my teacher. I don't experience, since that moment, since I woke up, I did experience the me coming back, mm -hmm. but I didn't experience as me, sorry for the stranger words of game, <laughs> me coming back in the me. I didn't believe in the game, in the game, in right. the me anymore. So I felt um, as a something that was just happening in the silence of my being, with all the patterns, uh, mental, emotional, physical, that this involves. And the, all these years uh, have been actually integrating this recognition every day. Mm -hmm. So when, I mean, I don't know if there is the space for this here. I, I like when the Kundalini rise up. Oh, there's a space. We, we talk yeah, about this. Yeah, yeah. So when the Kundal when when you wake up, the Kundalini rise through the Shishumna mm -hmm. and and Shakti, like madly in love with Shiva, with the emptiness, rise up, is ruptured, mm -hmm. and then you have this clarity, you know, like of seeing that you are not what you thought to be. Right. And this is the space where. I would say the majority of people like uh, stay when they wake up in this clarity, you know, and that point, the me, the conditional mind comes back, the idea to be a me, and all these false ideas are dissolved in the light of understanding. So it's like there is a clearing of the, the conscious mind. And many teachers teach from this space of clarity. Uh, I would say the majority of non-dual non -dual teachers teach from this. Then if if uh, the integration goes further, if the call for the for the deep is answered, uh, the energy goes down, the Kundalini Shakti Shiva goes down in the heart. And that point you deal with all the emotions that were behind those conditional patterns. And your heart breaks, you know, the, the beautiful uh, images of, for instance, of Christ, you know, on the cross with its heart open and inflamed and is at the center, actually, that is the true spiritual heart. It's something very real. And that is the moment in which from seeing that you're nothing, watching life, you know, you meet life in your heart and your, your heart is put in flame and is break, is, becomes broken open. Mm -hmm. And this happened, like, you know, I had for many years this feeling of having like a little camera above my head, you know, like watching live. And it's like, what happened? This happened actually into the first time it happened was in 2011, when I started giving satsang by myself. Mm. The, the, this camera kind of went down in the heart. Mm. And there was no more this kind of subtle duality, so to speak, between nothing and everything, mm. but was fused. And these uh, gave space to a, a great like dissolving of patterns about emotions, about like uh, uh, all the dark side of our emotion that we don't want to see, like anger or sadness or so there was a cleansing and integrating of that. And then in the last two years, the energy went down. With, I was very, very, very surprised of it because, you know, I didn't expect it at all and I felt after 14 years of seeing that I was not inside the body, it's like the self claimed the body. And I, I crossed the density of the form and and this awakening, awakening happened uh, on the level of the Hara. 
-hmm. And it's, it's very interesting, this, uh, and it's something that I'm still exploring and I'm sharing with people. Because in a sense, this embodying the last part, you know, like after you clear up like the conscious mind, the, you know, subconscious emotional response to conditioning, you go to the deeper part of conditioning, deepest part of conditioning that is uh, um, the genetic, the bodily conditioning, the, the true unconscious in a sense. And meeting the form, meeting the body from the self consciously, that's the point, <laughs> it's incredible and I'm still exploring it. I'm still, you know, like playing with it and I share what I've been seeing so far is an endless integration. Mm -hmm. And but but it gave me a lot of love for life and for substance and for matter and see that matter really is. Myself con condensed as that mm. physically. So a great sense of connection with things. That's nice. From this, mm. There's a lot to discuss actually in what you just said. Let's let's dwell on this for a while. So um, firstly, people will probably remember that Adyashanti often talks about awakening in the head, heart, and gut. I think that's kind of what you were just saying. Um, and first, you were saying, okay, many most teachers teach from the sort of awakening in the head area, and. Mm. Um, just what would you say would be the characteristic, since you've gone through all these stages yourself, what would you say would be the characteristic experience of someone who is awoken on that level? Uh, and also, if they're teaching, what would you say would be the quality or nature of their teaching, if that is the extent of their awakening? Uh I would say that uh, are those kind of sharings, and of course, saying this, you know, I have it's a generalization. Yeah. yeah, and it's great respect for everybody because sure. everybody is giving his own contribution where they are. Mm -hmm. And uh, but what I see that sometimes when the experience of somebody in all his honesty is just here, mm -hmm. you have this clarity that doesn't match with life. You know, you have people that you know saying you like, uh, oh everything is an illusion, like there is nobody in the body, that's it, it's all just one play of consciousness, that's mm -hmm. it, you know, like there is nothing to look for, there is nothing to integrate, all is just an illusion, and you feel they are a bit disconnected from life actually, and they're not very human, and, and this is, you know, and, and it's okay, because when you go through that stage, you need that in a sense, that, you know, uh, Varja sword, you know, to cut through things yeah, that are not Vajra. real, but it can also be very confusing to people who are trying to raise children and hold down a job and this and that to have it hammered into them that everything is just an illusion. I agree. I agree. In fact, in my experience, I have to say that when you go through that phase, you know, life gives you some slaps, mm. you know, and say, really? It's like that, <laughs> yeah. you know? And what about your wife? And what about your kids? And what about your, you know, uh, bank account and what about you you know you're being dealing with your mom that is yelling to you at the phone are you really okay with this illusion and life tests you yeah so, so that's it I also just I, want to add while well, we're on this level that I find it ironic that that is sometimes referred to as non-duality because it's actually duality there's been this big separation created between you know, the, the, the self or being or pure consciousness and this whole world, which is supposedly only an illusion. It's not, it's not a kind of a wholeness that, you, that incorporates both. I, I agree. And in fact, what I say often is that the, the, the game, the journey is watching and experiencing duality from our non-dual non -dual being. We are non-duality, but we're here to experience duality and to avoid the duality is the greatest duality of all. Yeah. I mean, one it's like thing something is, is separate from what you are. Yeah, one thing is dualism and one thing is duality. Mm -hmm. Being attached to duality is dualism and that is the source of suffering. Mm -hmm. But if you rest in the non-duality of your being, then, you know, meeting duality is the price, is the reward, mm. you know, is is heaven on earth, you know, it's it's uh, the paradise that is between us, you know, amongst us, you know, makes much sense. Yeah. When, it's, when instead, you know, and it doesn't mean that life is always pretty because sometimes life is raw and violent and, you know, it's innocent. Life doesn't know the difference between good and bad. We put a label on it. So it doesn't mean that if you wake up and you rest in emptiness, then everything is going to be okay. This right. is a kind of fairy tale. Of the seeker, mm -hmm. you meet life. You still, you know, you still experience pain if somebody die or grief. You know, 
it, it doesn't mean that you hold on to that grief forever. That's the difference. But you, you meet life for real. And I would say that sometimes certain teachings fail in that meeting life for real because maybe in all, you know, good heart and good intention, maybe through that forms consciousness haven't yet finished its warm work. That it doesn't mean that I finished mine. I think we never finish. I think we're here to experience the labyrinth, as we said before. Yeah. Until we have until until we have a form, we, we project a shadow. Mm. And so until we're here, we are here to, to dissolve polarities. It's an it's endless. I'm just I'm not telling you, I'm just telling you and whoever is listening how it is for me, you know? Yeah, you're speaking what from your own experience. <laughs> yeah, what I discovered so far, for instance, you know, I didn't know about these three, you know, mm -hmm. levels. And somebody told me, Shanti spoke about it, I say, oh, how beautiful. And after, you know, this happened, like all these teachers that have actually spoke about also how Rabindo mentioned mm -hmm. this integral yoga, you know? And I say, wow, and they never appeared in my life, these notions, you know, before. It's like, you know, only when I experience it, I said, ah, okay, this is what he's talking about. This is what he's talking about. It's like life gave you a feedback, you know, give you a feedback on what is going on. Yeah, same, same thing that happened earlier in your life, you know, when you figured uh, if, if I need a teacher, the teacher will come. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's, it's for, like this for everybody. When we are ready, the right information comes. Yeah. Okay. So we've talked about what the experience of life and the, might be like once the awakening has happened on the head level and how one might teach once that awakening has happened. How about the heart level? What would the experience be like once that I mean, awakening has progressed to there and how one might teach if that has been one's realization? I, I would say that, you know, uh, actually the first, the first great master comes into my mind that teaches from an open heart. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm not comparing myself to it. I'm just giving an example. Mm -hmm. It's actually Rumi, mm. you know, or St. Francis, somebody that is like expressing pure love, you know, yeah. and, and like letting, like really taking whatever happens in your life as something to be alchemically transformed in the love. You know, and and let go of is that kind of process. So, you have some teachers that are exploring this part, and are teachers that uh, are actually inviting you to to invite life, to invite grief or sadness or anger, and to not to um, intellectually work them out. You know, in a story, but really meeting them. You know, in your heart, and this is what you what you see in these kind of teachers that you feel that I would say the trademark is compassion. Mm. You know, in speaking about, you know, the greatest are Rumi and St. Francis are great, great example of this. I'm like great, greatest masters of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So there wouldn't be that coldness and aloofness that you sometimes see in sort of Neo Advaita teachers uh, that be more, uh, of a, more of a sweetness or something. I'm just trying to categorize a little bit. Yeah, yeah, of course we are generalizing. I yeah. would say that it, it also like uh, has to do really with the characteristic of the form, you know, because yeah, for instance... different personalities. For, uh, yes, for instance, uh, my teacher, for instance, was very aloof because it was British. Uh -huh. At the same time, you know, he had a great heart and, right. and, and this deep love, that is stillness, was very evident when you were close to him. Yeah. But uh, like other forms are more like, uh, I'm very extrovert, for instance, right. you know, because uh, the you're, form is Italian. You're normal so, uh, Italian. <laughs> yeah, so I hug and you and I joke, you know, I'm more, yeah. but this is the form. It doesn't mean that if you are introvert or more aloof, you don't know this. Yeah, good point. I would, I, I would say that it's more about to like, in your teaching, are you address, addressing the me with compassion? Mm. Are you addressing the personality with love and compassion. If you do, then you know this, yeah. you know, I would say it is more this because otherwise, you know, you have like uh, personality differences sure. and it might be confusing. Yeah, that's a good distinction. Um, okay, and let's take it to the third level, the Hara level. What would, yeah. be, what would the experience be like? What would a teacher who would realize to that extent be like? Well, what I what I, I can only speak of myself, mm -hmm. and I have to say this is quite new because it's only like a year and a half, two years that this has been happening and I'm meeting it. Mm -hmm. But what I discovered so far, what I see so far, is that 
is like in a sense you go in a great neutrality of being in which you meet from the neutrality all these polarities of uh, darkness and light and you go really like on the deep level and meeting matter, matter and meeting the density of the form from, from the emptiness of the self. And what I notice, at least in, in the change in my sharing, if this makes sense to you, is that like at the beginning, maybe many years ago, I was like trying to bring people to understand what I was talking about. And then I was trying to bring people to feel what I was talking about and address them in the feeling. And now is nothing. <laughs> I, they, just, they just appear in my awakening. So people wake up in, my, in myself. Mm. I am the emptiness in which they do wake up. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't, they don't, there is no homework. They don't have to understand or feel anything. They are me. Mm. So that's your perspective and that's their experience. Um, I suppose, yeah. Like yeah. the majority of people that speak to me after a meeting, maybe the one that didn't like it don't speak to me, I don't know. <laughs> but like uh, the, the people that speak to me after and say, when I, when I come here, I forget my questions mm. and it's really hard to, to regain them. And it seems that it's all happening on another different level. It's happening on, on like a deeper level in which like uh, we watch from stillness mm. what we are. So I would say that is like a, something that got mm, concluded at least here for me. And now I'm resting in this neutrality of being and meeting life and matter from this neutrality. Because you see, coming back to uh, Indian tradition, the Shakti, the Ma, is the, mother, is the mother of everything. So when you go from the father, the emptiness, into the mother, that is the, the, the sacred mother, the divine mother, that is manifestation, you meet all these polarities, you meet darkness and light, both in your heart and you have to remain still in this and you know like Shiva is the greatest yogi is the lord of yoga is the master of yoga mm -hmm. meets the Shakti meets the manifestation meets the mother you know in the stillness and this is you know if, if your if your mind is not clear if your heart is not completely open you can't meet this duality of manifestation still you would try to avoid something either because your mind is confused or because your heart is obscurated mm -hmm. so if your heart is open and your mind is clear you can meet the mother you can meet the manifestation so it sounds like the development has to be sequential in my experience, yes, but mm. like I'm not saying that this is must be for everybody. Right. This is my understanding. I see that if these are not clear, it's hard to stay here. You will yeah. get uh, you would get taken by passion. You know, mm. you would taken be taken away from by passions. You would taken away from ideal ideology. I wonder if that's why some teachers get in trouble where they're, they're teaching, they seem very bright, very charismatic and so on. And then they get involved in misbehaviors of various kinds. And I think you are quite right. Mm -hmm. I, I actually was doing this consideration the other day with a friend. Sorry. No, go ahead. <clears throat> and that uh, in a sense, you know, um, mm, you know, if you go in a position of power, um, before, you know, like, and, and, and you are not honest and authentic enough to see that life is continuously teaching you, you know, and you don't remain humble, you, you end up in trouble. Yeah. You can easily end up in trouble. Mm. And I, I consider myself very lucky, extremely lucky that, lucky that I had a, a, a real master beside me for many years. Because I thought, no, not all that I'm teaching comes from him. Some part and like a big part of what I share comes from him. But his presence anyway uh, helped me to remain um, authentic and in, in, integra, integrate, integrated, you know? Integrated, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Consistent, mm. you know? Right. 
We, like this is a journey that has you a lot of honesty, courage, humbleness, you know, and and these qualities are not qualities that the me has to have, of course. It's it's a kind of attitude that you know allow you to 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 meet life. Otherwise, you end up saying, okay, I arrived, you know, put my flag there, <laughs> you know, that's yeah. it. Check that off my bucket list, yeah. Yeah, and re remain a student forever. This yeah. is my Good indication. Point. Alma yes. always says that too. Uh, you know, oh. we, sh we should always have the attitude of a beginner. And yes. I've heard Adyashanti say similar things. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, like, uh, I don't know, you know, maybe we have this conversation another time and they discover something different. I don't want that my own understanding becomes a limitation in my discovery, in my knowing. Yeah. I'm, I'm just sharing where I am. And if this is of any use to anybody, I'm glad for them. But no, like, it is, I'm sure. It's, a use, it, it's it, useful it, to me. Um. <laughs> thank you. But like, like I, I, it's not, you know, uh, it's yours. Yeah. You know, I, I, I don't, I'm not responsible of the way in which people take what I say. I, I just take care of not giving any like uh, life advice, you know, Right. and I don't tell them what like to do. Like you should quit your job and go work Never. at Walmart I, or something. No, no, yeah. no. I don't give suggestions. Sometimes like very close friend try to bring me to do that, but like, yeah. very, like, but this is becomes more like uh, a friend, friend, you know, friend yeah. to friend conversation. But like, I don't give homework. I don't give practices. I don't, I don't have indication of life. I'm just inviting you to watch yourself from another perspective. That's it. And then see what life does with you. Yeah, that actually leads to a question I was going to ask you, which is that, uh, you know, you've talked about this progression through these different stages and everything. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, were you doing anything to facilitate this progression or did it just happen spontaneously? <laughs> and then the, the next question would be, well, would you advocate anything to others to go through this progression or would, would what should they do or not do <clears throat> in order for, to undergo similar development? No, no, I, I didn't do, as, as, a, as a me, I didn't do anything. It was done to me. Sure. <laughs> I mean, yeah. the me is the... After the, the initial thing. awakening, there was just a momentum which put you through all this. Yes, I mean, what, what, what we have to remember that this process of integration is not happening uh, to, uh, to the persona, to the person, is happening in consciousness. It's consciousness that remaining, you know, the emptiness, awareness, remaining always untouched and pristine and still meets itself in life. That's the movement of consciousness. So, like, although there is one awareness that is, as we know, empty, colorless, formless, soundless, blah, blah, there is endless level of consciousness, of manifestation of consciousness. So, um, when this process of integration happens, it doesn't happen to the person, but the person is what consciousness is working on. Okay, so there is no indication for the person because it's already spontaneously happening. It will happen spontaneously and the call for truth, you know, uh, we say like the, the, the father going into the mother, you know, is all this is happening and, and you know, spontaneously and is progressing at the pace of how much honesty, courage, authenticity is there. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because some people say things like, well, it's absurd to talk of levels of consciousness or anything because there's only this, there's only oneness and how could oneness have levels? And I think the answer would be, well, oneness, you know, pure consciousness doesn't have levels, but the degree to which it expresses or integrates or, or, you know, into the person has many, 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 many possible levels, endlessly, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah endless. It's like the way in which I represent it sometimes, if I have to use an image that, of course, is not going to be the thing in itself, is like if you have the sun, you know, and is endless rays, endless yeah. beams are irradiating. Mm -hmm. The light of the sun remain undivided and unbreakable and eternal, mm -hmm. the undying sun of awareness. And so all its beings have this light that is the same of the sun, is one with the sun. At the same time, each beam is radiated in a point in space and time and appears as a form. 
before appearing as a form appears as subtle levels, more and more dense, until appear as a form. This means that the sun is knowing itself through its own beings. And the ability of remaining calm is all the way through this condensed and more condensed level is our ability to embody awakening. Yeah. We could say that when the beam discover that the source of light is the sun, is the initial awakening. And the ability to bring down the light into matter and into density is the integration and the embodiment. Right. So simultaneously, we remain completely perfect and eternal where we are. And at the same time, we know ourselves more and more in our expression. And this is the embodiment. Right. And there's no end to that second part. No, it's endless because once it's done for what seems to be this form, you will carry on anyway, endlessly, you know, in your bigger form, your planet form, your universe form is endless. Mm. It's an, this is an endless universal game that consciousness is playing through all our forms, you know, and we are at the same time, the creature and the creator yeah. in one. Beautiful. One thing that always puzzles me, and I have discussions about this with a friend and other friends, is that you know this this notion of loss of a sense of the, the eye sense, loss of a sense of personal self. Um, I can, s in my own experience and understanding, I can see losing the sense that that's all I am, but but and, and realizing that I am something much larger than that. But to lose it altogether, I I don't understand how living would be possible. It's like saying the ocean analogy. You know, okay, yeah, I'm a wave, but I'm not only a wave, I'm actually this ocean, but you know, I'm ocean arising as this particular wave. So it's not like the wave goes away, it's more like one's limited experience that I am only the wave goes away. How do you relate to yeah. all that? Yeah, I mean, in my experience, it's like at the beginning you believe to be the wave, mm -hmm. and in the awakening, if the energy, sorry, if the attention comes back completely on itself, you discover you are the depth of the ocean. Right. And actually, the whole ocean as manifestation can disappear in that. And you have like really a disappearance of the entire manifestation into nothingness. Mm -hmm. Then the world comes back into life. And I would say a part of this energy that is now like expressed will be on some level hooked in the form. Not that I feel to be inside the body, right. but some some part of this awareness is engaged with the body. Otherwise, the body would disappear. Yeah, it would die or something. Yeah, I mean, like if you have samadhi, you know, you, you can have many levels of samadhi mm -hmm. in which uh, you have literally a disappearing of uh, of the manifestation, yeah. even a slowing, a slowing down of time and a, and a stopping. Right. You know, but that's not a living experience. No, these are peak experiences. Right. And, and I'm, I'm just mentioning you to say that to work in a balanced way, again, the cross, I really like this analogy because for me, it like, tells a lot, um, is like you remain like belonging to the true self and experiencing life. So if I take a glass of water and I start to see the disappearance in 1,000 molecules. It's not really functioning, you know? But like taking a glass of water, being aware at the same time that this is a body that is happening in me, and there is no actual any Rick there. Rick is just an image in the screen. And at the same time, talking to him, everything is real, and, and drinking the water is the balance. If there is not this balance, you don't bring that light into the beams until the end. You stop somewhere. Mm. So meeting the form from the formless requires you to be so steady in the emptiness that you can actually engage into life. When the body dies, uh, like these beams carries on, you know, as manifestation, but that expression called Shakti is finished. It's like a page of the book, a chapter of a book that is finished. Yeah. So living life, you know, coming back to what you say, living life 
in this sense is like a part of you remains engaged with the word and more you're able to be, remain engaged with the word and remaining present to what you are simultaneously, more you can bring reality in the manifestation. You feel reality, sorry, you feel the manifestation with your own reality. Mm. The light of feel the self. Feel or fill? Feel, F-I-L-L. -E -L. Okay, yeah. yes, you feel. feel it, yes. Yeah, you fill up the manifestation with the reality of you. Mm -hmm. And the ability to do that, you know, that's the balance because Maybe sometimes you topple over and you get like attached to things or you remain like disengaged too much and you're not able to bring yourself into matter. That's the integration, you see. Right. How much how much the light of awareness can meet life? Mm -hmm. How much? To the deepest, to the darkest spots of uh, consciousness, you know, to our like wild, you know, raw uh, dark side, can we? You know, if we can do that, we meet everything. Good. And, uh, yeah. I want to ask like you some questions about that, but first, more questions. But first, I'm going to ask a question from a, a, a viewer, which relates to what you're saying. And then whatever you don't answer in this, I'll ask more. Um, this yes. is from Mark Peters in Santa Clara, California. He asks, um, can you speak more about your current sense of beingness? Do you feel yourself to be sitting on the couch, looking out from behind your eyes or heart or gut into the computer's camera? Or is the emptiness simultaneously looking without and within from everything in the sensory field? Or, question mark. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I hope I'm able to, to explain this uh, uh, clearly. Um, I'm, not see, I'm not feeling to be sitting on the couch. I am the emptiness in which the sitting is, ap is happening and the feeling cold feet is happening cold feet uh, yeah. oh you want to get some socks <laughs> no it's okay it's okay i, I it's fine yeah. and i am the emptiness that is experiencing the the joy and the fun of having this conversation mm -hmm. and i i am i am what is creating all this i'm conscious of it and at the same time i'm playing the role as if i'm just here there is no thought or, or feelings before these words there is nothing before these words these words come up from emptiness and everything is arising from the emptiness of my being, including this this conversation. But I'm not. I'm. I don't know anything about this conversation. I don't understand it at the same time. I don't know anything. Not in the way I used to know it. I am this conversation. I don't know it. So I know nothing. And and I am everything. This is this is my experience. That's good. Maybe he'll have a follow-up question, but it reminds me of the way I tried to describe it if people ask, which is that, you know, I'm, I'm everywhere, I'm nowhere, and I'm right here. It's like all three, yeah. all three are true, you know? Yeah. And you can extend it to the creation itself. Here it is, and yet it's not. Nothing ever happened. Yeah. And both seem to be true. Yes, because you are the impossible meeting between form and void yeah. human experience is the miracle like incredibly the formless appear as a, appears as a form and is still conscious to be formless yeah. this is the is impossible for the mind because you see the mind is an object so the mind cannot understand this I gave up my understanding I gave up my feelings I gave up everything mm -hmm. to be in order to be everything so, like, like now, you know. But it's fun you know, to talk about, even though we can't totally understand it with the mind. It's like you play around it, you know. Yeah, because like, it, isn't this like so, you know, uh, passionate, like trying to say it and failing all the time, so we can re say it again. Yeah. You know, this is my life. It's I kind mean, of part of the integration, really, is you know, integrating it into words, even though yes. it can't be integrated. Absolutely, I agree with you. It's good that you said it because. You know, that's why my teaching is made of question and answers, is mm -hmm. not theoretical, right. because uh, the people, you know, when they are able to bring up on, on the word level and the sound, that deep feeling, that deep movement of consciousness that is moving, when they're able to bring it up into words, the consciousness is more able to see it clearly. Yeah. In other words, even making a question is part of the understanding, of the true understanding. 
And then the ability to watch that question from emptiness will allow emptiness to change the question in dissolving the question. Mm. Because a, a true answer is dissolving the question. Dissolving, yes. Dissolving, yeah. Right. Yeah. That's why we love somebody like Rumi, you know, who was a master of expressing the inexpressible. Yeah. Yeah, because he, he, he was more in love with the love than with the words for the beloved. Yeah, like so, you said, he, he was speaking from the heart, using words yeah. which usually belong to the mind, but actually channeling them from the heart, as it were. Yeah, and that, and that is the integration, you know, when you integrate it here, you can speak out your heart. Yeah. Can and, you think of examples of speaking from the gut, speaking from the hara? Uh, Besides well, there yourself? Is, there is, <laughs> Uh, uh, I don't know. It's not coming now in my mind. Okay, don't <laughs> so, worry about it. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, like, what, what is the quality, I would say, is that there is no anymore even a feeling. Mm. There is feeling behind it. There is nothing. And, then, and there is a movement on the tree level. But I would say, if I'm speaking about this form as, as a tool, mm -hmm. okay? This tool is using these three centers simultaneously. Mm. So it is clarifying, opening the heart, and resting in the neutrality. It's simultaneous. Yeah. Let's talk about the, the body or the person or the whatever we are as a tool for a second. So, yeah. you know, traditionally it's understood this tool contains a number of different components. There are the organs of action such as the, hand, yeah. the mouth and the hands and the feet and so on. There are the, org there are the organs, or there are the, the, sen the senses, the organs of senses mm -hmm. of perception, five senses. Yeah. The, so those are called the karmandriyas and the jnanandriyas, I think. And then there's um, subtler components, you know, there's the, we, we hear talks like, you know, the jiva and the atman and the, you know, various subtle terms. Um, and, you know, if, if someone says, well, you know, all sense of a personal self has fallen away and there's just a functioning this this body yeah. it's just a yeah. functioning anymore um, exactly is that your experience yeah because you know uh we are the functions of god <laughs> as a forms we are the functioning of awareness right so there is no person there is just action so Shakti is an action of the awareness. Mm -hmm. Rik is a, a, an action of awareness. And teaching, there is no teacher, there is the function. You see, guru, the guru is a function. Right. Guru, guru you, you know much better than me, is from darkness to light, guru. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and is a function. And, and life is the guru. Life is the function through which consciousness is waking up. Right. In this sense, life is the guru and can appear as human forms sometimes that express that function. Mm -hmm. And if you remember this, you don't believe that truth comes from people. There is no truth coming from people at all. Truth is not in people. There is no truth in my words. Yeah, uh, no, I understand that part. Let's say so Shakti Katarina is a function. And yes. as a function, she has a body with its organs of action. She has senses. She can see, smell, hear, taste. Yeah. Um, and is that all there is to it? Or is there some kind of something or other that distinguishes her from other people that, that if we go into a room and we say, hey, Shakti, she turns her head uh, yeah. because there's a sense of some sense of personhood still exists. It hasn't been totally obliterated. Is that uh, true to say or no? Uh, th there is not, there is not that that turning of the head is not because there is a me here feeling that I'm turning the head and mm -hmm. you're talking to me. So why does it happen? Uh, <laughs> it's not easy to explain. It's happening simultaneously that I am the caller and the cold that yeah. are happening in the emptiness of being. Mm -hmm. So I'm experiencing myself as the calling and as the cold, but because I'm using this tool, and this maybe replies to your uh, question better, mm -hmm. because I'm using this tool, I'm experiencing like the, the, the vibration of the voice here in my mouth, yeah. you know, that is moving the lips and moving the skull because the sound is produced. And, and it is felt here because this is the tool. 
Right, but you, but, are, but what you really are is all the people in the room and the table and, and everything else. Yeah. So why but, doesn't the table turn its head or why doesn't your friend Joe turn his head, you know, when, when somebody says, hey, Shakti? Because, it's because there's something associated with this particular tool that, I, that knows that that's what they're referring to, you know? But, but because in your saying, there is the assuming that there is somebody here that decided to move and the reasons. Right. So I, I am, it's everything is more clear if we understand this. All that is appearing is not appearing as a doing, is appearing as being, okay? Mm -hmm. So in my own being, somebody arrives and say, hey Shakti, and in my being this body is moving. Mm -hmm. But because I'm experiencing my own being through this tool, mm -hmm. I experience the senses, the, the hear and the eyesight and the feeling of the tip fingers and all the rest here because I'm, I'm experiencing, I'm touching myself, I'm touching my being through this spot. Yes, but when you even to say my being, it's not your being, it's being. You yeah, know, but when I say my no being, possession of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. When I say my being, I don't talk. I'm not speaking about if it's mine. You know, my being because everything is me. So that's why I say my being. I see. That's why you're saying. Okay. It. So like so anybody uh, could say that. Everybody yeah, could say my of being. Course. Yeah, yeah. Of course, everything is my being. Yes, everything is the being. You know. Yeah. But like there is not in anybody else that can say that. You know, in my word, mm -hmm. because anybody else is an expression of my being. So in my being is happening calling and is happening that I experience the body moving. Yeah. But there is not an author of this action. Okay. It's clear here that there is no uh, somebody that say because I move there, I move like this. The proof, you know, it would be like if you watch, let's say, if you watch a movie, okay? Mm -hmm. And in the movie, like somebody is replying and say something. It doesn't mean that there is a person inside inside the screen actually moving. It's just the appearance of that. Yeah. So the appearance of that is actually the entire appearance of that is a movement of your own being. I don't want to sound complicated, but if you really see that there is nobody here, but just beingness, everything gets very easy. It's simply that being, the being, this one being, is expressing itself through a particular form. So make experience on the sensor, sensorial level only through this location. Mm. If, if, for instance, you know, your dog has to go for a pee, I don't feel, you know, the pee and the bladder of the dog. Right. You know, at the same time, from my perspective, from this tool that I'm using to experience my own creation that is life, I will experience the dog from this particular point of view and you experience your dog from another point of view yeah. as maybe a being behind your your back, you know, as, as a, some, something behind your back that is living and maybe moving or like, I don't know, uh, breathing and something. So say that this and this, I, don't, I hope it doesn't make it even more complicated. There is moments in which you like, you know, side side viewing like out of, the, out of the corner of your eye. Yeah. yeah, yeah. In which you see the entire scene. Mm -hmm. Like the geometri geometrical representation, as Jean Klein was saying, of the entire scene. And you can watch something from many points of view simultaneously. Mm -hmm. But this can be done just with the corner of your eyes, because if you do that, the body would dissolve into light. Mm -hmm. And this is what happens when we die. Interesting. There's a couple of things I want to say here. Um, I mean, one is, you know, we, what you're indicating is that we are the divine intelligence that animates all forms, and yeah. that that is that, that there is really nothing other than that. The forms themselves are that, um, but it somehow functions through a particular form, or this form, or that form. So through this form, the Shakti form, you know, you don't experience the dog needs to pee, but the divine intelligence, as expressed in the dog, the dog has that experience. So in other words, we don't gain omniscience by having this in which we know what everybody in the world and in the universe is feeling and thinking and needing and all. We just know what's happening in our particular form. Um, again, calling it our particular yeah, form. Yeah. Go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. because we don't meet in the experience. We meet in the known experience. So I am, I am the known experience of your dog. No, K-N-O-W-N, known. Uh, then I am 
the no n o the no experience no experience yeah we are we meet in the known experience of our being we meet yes into 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 nothingness we meet uh-huh. in nothingness okay and um so i am the no n o experience of your dog uh-huh. and when you live from this okay the form seem to answer to that is like the manifestation seems to bow to to answer to reply to this knowing yeah okay so but it doesn't mean that i'm experiencing what everybody is thinking or feeling that would be very confusing that, that would be omniscience and, <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. And, and like and but I the also, divine we presume does experience that if we if we could say that the divine if the divine because the divine is experiencing what the moth is experiencing what the dog is what the elephant is that it's ha- yeah. it's all those things are sense organs yeah. of the infinite yes yes and and that is emptiness yeah emptiness is experiencing the moth flying and in love with the flame and he's experiencing the dog they say oh why are you bringing me for a walk or you know like i was experiencing like the cold feet of shakti or just the fun of conversation with rick god is experiencing it is the emptiness so when you rest in the emptiness you kind of sense that but it doesn't mean that you know it you know yeah. and simultaneously in the human experience at least you are experiencing your limitless and your limited function i think like this this question that you made maybe help to clarify what i said before in this meeting point as the human being the bridge between form and emptiness you remain conscious to be the emptiness at the same time you are experiencing yourself as human yeah. so I, i'm experiencing life as a shakti and i can call that my life of course yeah. you know you could even call it yourself in, in your yeah. re- your yeah. relative self relative yeah. expression Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. At the same time, like, it's like, you know, you have one tree with, uh, like, a lot of buds, you know, and mm-hmm. the springtime comes, and and the springtime make the tree blossom. Mm. And you are, at the same time, the springtime bringing the tree to life and make the buds blossom, and you are the bud. You're a particular bud, yeah. So you are experiencing the springtime from the bud point of view, mm-hmm. knowing that you are the tree. Yeah. So I guess the reason I get hung up on this point is that um, it relates to what you were just saying, which is that I don't see why I don't have a problem with the idea, and I, but I may be totally wrong, uh, that you know we have the physical body, we have the senses, we have the organs of action and all that, and that on some subtle level there is a something that... Um, associates with this particular body that is like an interface or uh, through which you know this body is animated which is not ultimately what we are but is uh, some degree of expression uh, a relative expression that is unique to each being yeah yeah, yeah. i agree i agree i agree totally with you okay. just take off the idea that there is somebody that is having the experience and then we agree completely Yeah, I think I can take that off. <laughs> I mean <laughs> That's it. That's it. Like it's 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 happening is the entire game experience itself through one of its character. Yes, and its character consists of these components which senses, organs of actions and some kind of jiva or some sort of kernel of individuality which is not ultimately real but which is essential to the functioning of that particular expression. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's not like a, it's it's not really I would say a functional ego. I wouldn't call it like that. No. I would say that it's simply the functioning of the tool, yeah. having a sense of like knowing, oh, what is happening to this body? This body needs to eat. But right. I don't say that. I said I'm hungry. I'm going to prepare a meal. Just go for you it. You know, it, yeah. So is yeah. is uh, well, that, that's 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 helpful. Um, you know, it helps to resolve something that I've been sort of I would say bugging this, me for some time. If if I can if I can uh, if I can uh, say maybe um I would ask myself is there an in consciousness in my consciousness I would I would if I was you you know I would ask this uh, is a place where I want to land is maybe a place where I want to put my feet and land you know something safe to land maybe if I land safely here 
I can experience everything. I don't know, I have this feeling when you ask me this question that there is a, maybe this movement. I don't know if it makes sense to you. Um, but not like, yeah, I'm not completely clear on what you're asking or saying. Maybe you could say it slightly differently, maybe? I mean, when we ask, you know, it seems like that these kind of questions yeah. are question of localization, you know, mm -hmm. like where there is a desire to locate yourself somewhere, you know? I think what I'm trying to understand is the mechanics of it, where, you know, yes. sometimes people speak in a way which seems to de contradict the, the way they apparently function. And I'm trying to understand the mechanics of the functioning and whether there okay. is really a complete elimination of any sort of individual expression of being and, and the whole functioning is like an empty shell or whether that thing is very subtle. Like here's an example, here's an analogy. Let's say a stream, which is very localized river, goes into the ocean and you can no longer really distinguish it from the ocean. And yet within the ocean, you have currents which are flowing this way and that, which might be hard to distinguish from the ocean, but they, in a sense, even though they're really just the ocean, there's something within the ocean that has some kind of individual expression. Yeah, but that individual expression, I, I love your analogy, it's very good because it's all just water, so it's a very good analogy. That current is a movement of the being. Right, it's, it's a not, movement it's, of the being within the being. Yeah, yes. exactly. It's not a movement of a person that is doing it. Right. The fact that there is individuality in the manifestation, it's not the proof that we are separated. No, I we agree. Are, okay, so yeah. we are all flowers of the same tree. Is uh, is is If we see this, um, the individual expression of what appears to be like, I am here and you are there and I am my thought and my feeling, is simply a movement of consciousness that is appearing like that. Yeah, of I was the not same implying that, right. It's all being, just sort of interacting exactly. within itself. That, that's, why, that's why I was saying before, maybe it's a matter of localization, knowing where you land your feet. If you land your feet on being, you know, yeah. then all makes sense. It's all just a movement of your own being. Yeah. Like, like, like if you know, if you have like a symphony and you have a flute playing or a violin, anyway, the symphony is the symphony, right. but the symphony is played out through the flute and through the violin and through the piano and so on. Good point. And it's all one orchestra. It's not exactly. Yeah. I mean, there are individual instruments. Yes. But in, a, in the bigger picture, it's just one orchestra and the individual instruments are just components within that orchestra. And it seems that they are played out by individuals, but actually is the music that is playing through yeah. all this. It's the silence that is vibrating and producing sound. So Yeah, which is, brings up an interesting point, and it relates to that thing you said a little bit ago about peering out of the corner of your eye, which is that, you know, could we think of being not as being a, a just completely homogenous wholeness, but is actually having impulses within it, impulses of intelligence, energy, whatnot, that of are course. sort of percolating within the wholeness of being. Of course, you know, like seeing everything as one being doesn't mean that everything is harmon harmonious as the mind thinks it is, harmonious. Mm -hmm. Like there is, a, there is a darkness, there is light, there is like, a, there is everything, you know. The beauty of being impersonal is that you can express as anything, you know, individuality and impersonality do meet in the human experience. And, and this is the greatness to me of the human experience is this like really like the meeting of the two things together. So you can see contradictions, paradox, things going in opposite direction in one being. Why not? Yeah. You yeah. know, only if you hook to a side, you say, oh, this can't be, you know, in, in love, you know, this can be. Love is unconditional. Anything can be in love. Otherwise, it's not love. I mean, it's not what I call love, at least. Yeah. This is what the word Brahman is supposed to signify, I believe. Um, Brahman comes from a word meaning great. And the idea is that it's, it's the absolute, the relative, everything contained within a larger wholeness and the whole is more than the collection of its parts. And um, so exactly. it, it kind of harmonizes or subsumes everything within, within a larger reality. Yes, it's, a, it's absolutely like this. We are, we, from the absolute of our being, we appear as the relative. 
remain in the absolute. Right. Every, everything is contained in this. So calling somebody and the, the head is turning, as in, you know, as famously said, it doesn't mean that there is somebody there. It means that the absolute is experiencing as if it was a person and is experiencing that as if it was a person as a movement of my being. My cold feet are a movement of my being. Yes, it's being as if they were cold feet, as if it yes. were cold feet. And being, we, we being, have being yeah. as if it were the moon and being as if yeah. it were the galaxy and exactly. so on. Exactly. Yeah. There, there is no, I don't know if this is helpful even more, there is no subject object relationship. Right. You know, I'm not emptiness experiencing life, it's just all a movement of my own being. So speaking is a movement of my being, like listening is a movement of my being, everything is is moving and is me. And yet, could you say that um, whereas in, in reality there is no subject-object relationship, there's just oneness, just, just being, and yet at the same time there's a subject-object relationship where there's the, you know, the knower, the known, and the process of knowing. And yet, yeah. and yet at the same time there isn't, and yet there is, and yet there isn't. And there's yes. like infinite frequency between the two. Yes, because for oneness to know itself, it has to appear as two. Exactly. Yeah. And you see, I think this really like, like in a sense, the only one that remains frustrated in this is the one that wants to contain this in a phrase or in a frame mm. or in, into something. Otherwise, yeah. this remains just like a openness with no answer. Yeah. And you see, that's why they talk in the Vedic tradition of the infinite dynamism of you know, at, at the root of creation, Shiva, which is pure silence, and Shakti, which is your name, and is also the, the sort of the tendency to manifestation that is contained within the infinite silence. And, um, you know, and ultimately manifestation doesn't happen, and yet it does. And, it, and, the, and the sort of the, the infinite frequency between three and one yeah. and three and one creates the yes. fact that there's this huge potential latent in every even in physics, they say that in a cubic yes. centimeter of empty space, there's more latent energy than there is in the whole manifest universe. Yeah, because everything is like pulsating, like appearing and disappearing. Right. Like we, we, we are here and we are not here. Right. And the fact that we are not here allows us to be here. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, now that thing you said a little while ago, peering out of the corner of your eye kind of caught my attention. And I'm, I'm wondering where, what that signifies. But... I had, I, I had heard this explanation many years ago that the growth of wholeness takes place sort of by the expansion of the circumference of awareness to incorporate more and more and more of creation, such that initially it would be one's primary object of perception that would be seen in terms of the self, and then secondary, and then tertiary, and then on and on out until the, and eventually the whole creation was incorporated in that wholeness. I'm wondering mm. if that might be what you're alluding to there, or maybe not. Mm. Um, it seems, you see, everything that is appearing, sci science is explaining this uh, much better than me, mm -hmm. is uh, like a, a fractal mm -hmm. appearing. Um, what I was referring to when I speak about geometrical representation, that is actually an expression of Jean Klein, mm -hmm. a, a mm -hmm. master I really love uh, and appreciate is that there can be a moment in which you look a manifestation and you catch the perfection of the manifestation not because you land on any point of view but it's like simultaneously you hold for a second whole point of view simultaneously right and you see that all then amounts to nothing and you die like a climax, you climax in the joy of seeing the, per the perfection mm. of it. Of course, this is a peak experience, uh, but is it is experience that is possible when you meet and know yourself into everything. Yeah. Well, they say that the whole is contained in all of the parts, you know? Exactly, that, that yes. What, what is here is everywhere, what is not here is nowhere at all. And... Um, it's, it's kind of like a hologram, you know, you, you know the, you, the way a hologram works, you have a piece of film and if you shine a laser through it, it, it 
projects the original object that yeah. was imprinted in that hologram. Then you cut the piece of film in half and just shine a laser through the half piece of film and you get the same object in its totality because yeah. the whole is contained in all the parts. Yeah, and, and like what is appearing is the reflection, the manifestation of a light that remain always unseen. Mm. But what if you could pick the pattern of it for a fraction of a second? Mm. You would die in ecstasy. <laughs> yeah, maybe the growth from you know the stage that you've described so far is is in the direction of being able to do that without dying. Yeah, I mean, I had that, and and the body seems to be alive. Yeah. Now <laughs> maybe I'm, you could have it for one minute, two minutes, ten minutes. Yeah, but an like, hour. But I I enjoy being here and being shakti and drinking the glass of water and having coffee and having fun with my new friend Rick. Yeah, but that's not you know, to say you Rick, wouldn't still be able to do that even if that degree of expansion had taken yeah, place. Yeah, I mean I mean uh, I don't want um, I don't want to sound complicated and also I don't want to give the impression that I'm having anything special here mm -hmm. because this is not really my intention. I want people to see that this is possible and true of them where they are exactly as it is their life. Oh, yeah. But I do experience people in myself, mm -hmm. you know, like many times, you know, like like maybe a face appears here and maybe later like a person call me say, you know, I had this understanding. I was watching a video of yours. I had, so I have an extended um, knowing of myself beyond the apparent limitation of my form. Mm -hmm. But I don't speak a lot about it because this would confuse people in believing that they have to have psychic or strange experiences in order for them to see what they are. No, I understand that. Um, Amma sometimes says, there she is, that um, you know people have asked her about this and she says that like when she goes to bed at night she's flooded with the images of the people all over the world who are sort of yeah. thinking of her and reaching out to her and stuff like that and she somehow on some level processes all that, you know, deals with it. Um, and I don't think it should confuse people or, or make them feel that, you know, this is some kind of weird, special state that they would never uh, attain. I think mm -hmm. it's always good to have a vision of possibilities and to really know to what extent human evolution can progress, you know, and not to be unrealistic or unnatural about it and assume that we've attained something we haven't or nor to be discouraged and feel like I'll never attain what that person d did, but to just have a clear idea of the roadmap, you know, of, of what, okay. the what the territory covers. Okay, thank you for saying this. I mean, for me, teachers are like maps, you know, speaking of maps. Yeah. And, and we are the treasure. And, mm -hmm. and we can use, you know, you can, if, you, if this map of is any, of, uh, any use, please use it. Um, definitely, like, you know, like before coming here in the United States, I've been here for now, like, more than a month mm -hmm. and I will go away in March and it's like I met many people in myself before meeting them in form before even knowing their name you yeah, know yeah. but I, I met the shape of them mm -hmm. in my being when I arrived here this sounds very like new age I know but it surprised me a lot the first night I arrived here I couldn't sleep because I had a lot of jet lag mm -hmm. I, I mean it was nine hour flight so sure. So I was here actually in this same couch I'm in the house of my friend watching the bay. There is a San Francisco Bay from, from the window outside here. And I start like, you know, I couldn't sleep. So I couldn't like make any noise because everybody was sleeping. So I just watching the view and I start sensing myself as the bay. And I was starting to sense myself as the ocean. And at a certain point, I sent in myself whales and the consciousness of whales. Interesting. And I made this amazing contact with them as if, you know, like I was kind of speaking with them, yeah. you know, that if it makes any sense to you. And I'm not, you know, I'm not the kind of person like a dolphin person or whale person that, you know, I, I mean, of course I love all animals, but I've never been um, in touch with this before. Right. So it surprised me. You're not so an animal I, communicator like some people are. Yeah. yeah, so like, like I'm, I'm making this example to, to say that the ability of consciousness to know itself in the manifestation is very ample and it is not limited to the form. Mm -hmm. So for me, the experience that I had it was very beautiful and left me with a great love for, for, for these animals and what they represent in consciousness, you know, they're uh, in a sense, um, how to say, 
You know, everything is like a seed that is expressing as a form. So I touch the seed of their expression and I'm so grateful that they exist and the big love that is there in these animals. Huge love for humanity is beautiful. Nice. And, and, nice. And, and the frequency of the sound is like a, a love prayer for Earth, you know, for Gaia. This was something that happened in me, and maybe it's all my imagination, mm-hmm. but it has been something very real for me, in a sense, you know, very strong. Yeah. And, and, and this is just an example, you know, to tell you that you can experience things that are beyond your apparent limitation. But I wouldn't address so much attention towards it, because otherwise you end up believing that it's about having experiences. And it's really about instead meeting life as it is. Sorry if I sounds like very like nitty gritty, you know, this is very British. No, 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 it's good. (laughs) But like very, you know, like ordinary, because sometimes otherwise we lose, we lose in, in, you know, in in the possibility of having like special effects, experiences. Yeah. And, and I had the law, I had a, a, a handless amount of Kundalini experiences, psychic experiences, many things, maybe because my body is inclined towards it, you know, it's a function of the mm-hmm. body. But it doesn't mean that I'm awakened before because of it. No, it's just a, <laughs> a it's just kind of just an add on sort of. Yeah, yeah because you can have because you can have these experiences and not being awakened. Exactly. You can you can be very empathic, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, and and be very psychic and not being awakened and you can be awakened and not having these experiences. Yep. And for you, you know, you're just the ordinary, you know, John's meat around the corner and it's okay and yeah. it's beautiful at being John's meat, you know. Uh, so, Here's I an mean, analogy. Um, you know, let's say that life is like a big territory and in the territory there are diamond mines and gold mines and silver mines and all kinds of interesting things that you could explore. Yeah. But the territory is commanded by a fort in the middle. And if you start exploring all the mines without having first captured the fort, then it's not really your territory and Mm. it can be sort of you're on shaky ground you know the owner of the territory might come and get you or something so you want to capture the fort first and then having captured the fort you can choose if you wish to explore this or that or just stay in the fort it's 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 according to your dharma you know Um, but that kind of puts things in perspective so people could there could be people out there exploring these mines who haven't captured the fort there could be people who have captured the fort who aren't exploring the mines or there could be people who have done who are doing both but at least the, the capturing the fort is first priority. Yeah, I mean, like the greatest thing that uh, was uh, I was advised on is was whatever experience, energetic experience you might get, just let it be an experience. Don't play with it. Don't, don't make claim a big deal it. Of it yeah. Don't make a big deal at all. Don't become proud of it. It's right. just stuff, mm-hmm. you know. So this was a great tip because, like, considering the amount of stuff that happened after awakening to the body, like a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of Kundalini experiences, probably because the body, you know, I haven't done any like purification really before. So mm-hmm. it was like full force, you know, like it would have become confusing me if I would have somebody telling me, oh, it's great you had this because this means this. You're and this, special, this. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, many people are actually experiencing Kundalini um, they have Kundalini experiences without knowing what is Kundalini. It's mm-hmm. very, very common, as you probably know. Yeah. More common than what we believe. And maybe they get scared about it. So knowing that maybe what they have once they've gone to the doctor and seen that there is no disease, of course, that maybe it's something else is useful. But going in details about it can be very confusing in my experience. Yeah. And indulging in it and sort of milking it and, yeah. you know, getting into Kriyas and shouting and all that stuff, just sort of like over-dramatizing it. I think that can be a hang-up too. I mean, like, I, I had, I had uh, uh, people experiencing like a spontaneous like mudra and yeah, movement of the hands and all that things, you know, can happen. Mm-hmm. But if you think about it, all these things happen because there is actually an obstacle. The Shakti is trying to work out through the form. So it's actually our, our signs of resistances because the greatest realization is nothingness, is silence, is stillness. So like, you know, being normal and being like, you know, 
silent is the greatest achievement. Not doing like many like mantras. No, sorry, mantras. I want to say mudras. mudras and yeah, yeah and kriyas yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah and you can imagine Ramana. Would he be sitting there going through kriyas or anything? He he was ground. He had arrived. You know, there was he'd worked it all out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, like, for me, what, what is important is really for people to see that whatever is their experience, they don't have to be afraid of it. Whatever is the experience, you are the no experience experiencing it. Yeah. You are not in this experiencing. You can actually welcome everything in life. Right. You don't have to be afraid of life. This is the greatest thing to me. You should have a confidence, perhaps, that something good is happening, even if you don't completely understand yeah, that it's like, good, but just be patient, be tolerant, persevere. Yes, yeah. That that is that what is happening is actually a movement of your own being, and it's something that is coming to reveal something to you that yeah. maybe you haven't seen, or something to experience. You know, we we tend to apply a meaning to things. You know, in a sense, say, oh, this is happening because so I understand this. It's even beyond that. You know, it's, beyond it's our just human understanding. Yeah, it's it's meeting life. Yeah. And maybe some understanding comes out of it. And maybe it's just like, I just did it, you know, mm. just happened. This, this has been my life. There's wow. something cool about that whale experience you had that I'm just tempted to say, which mm -hmm. is that it synced to me. I don't think it was your imagination. I, I, prob I feel like you probably were having a real experience. But it, what it indicates or signifies is that, you know, whereas, let's say, the iceberg, it just, it, it appears very small above the water, but as you go deeper, it's, it turns out to be much bigger than it appears. So the, the capacity of our senses, which is very limited on the gross level, just through the, the physical body, if we get down to the subtler level of the senses, expands out to include a much greater range than the physical body uh, could possibly uh, experience. And this mm -hmm. is the tip of the sunbeams. Right. Just the tip, tip of the iceberg or the sunbeam, yes. or whatever metaphor we want to so use. So our, our being is all the ways. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Well, this has been totally delightful, and, and we could go Thank on for you. another two hours. But um, <laughs> like, like the dog you alluded to, perhaps we both have to pee. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I was sensing it. No, I'm joking. <laughs> But um, I'm sure we'll do another one someday, you know, yeah, Espe especially you. since you have this attitude, which I agree with, that, <laughs> that um, there's no end to it. it. So it's interesting to consider. I mean, I've, I've talked to people at the end of interviews and said, you know, well, where do you think we'll go from here? And they say, where could it go? This is it. But, um, you know, I have a feeling like if I were to talk to you in five years, we'd have a whole new conversation based upon everything yeah. that had unfolded in the last five years. Probably, probably. What, where, where I'm heading to, and I'm leaving you with this, mm -hmm. is really like how when you really belong to your true self, mm -hmm. how really like the form and the manifestation, the physical form is reformed in a new way. Yeah, it's, tr so, it's totally like, transformed. And, and it, yeah. can, it actually can be transformed to the point, theoretically, there, there are tr tales of this in the traditional things of becoming a celestial body instead of just a physical gross flesh yeah. and blood body yeah it is like that yeah. but like because it's something i'm still like um inquiring in myself yeah uh, i tell you in five years okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll just be sitting here in our light bodies in five or years. May, or, or maybe, or maybe we just here having coffee and say, oh, no, how is yeah. the dog? Is <laughs> there <laughs> have a new dog?" <laughs> yeah, and it would be great anyway. In any event, you're coming to the Sand Conference in October. Yeah, I do. Yeah, good. I do. So I'll see you out there, and, and yes. maybe some of the people watching or listening to this would like to come. It's always a great fun to to go to that conference yes, and get absolutely. together with everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. Send. Uh, I don't know if I can mention it. Sure. Send. Uh, yeah. Organize with me. I always promote Send. I was oh, like. Thank you. Like like Send. Send organize with me uh, actually a retreat oh, in uh, in California mm -hmm. between the 14 of March and the 18 of March in mm -hmm. Mount Madonna in Watsonville. Mm -hmm. And then so if anybody is inspired, there is still space, and you're welcome to come. Great. And I think you're going up to Seattle, right? Yeah, I I'm going to to Seattle, to Portland, and to New York. New York. And uh, where about in New York? Um, we are actually search, searching for uh, the place. Okay. So I don't know yet. Is it in the city or upstate Manhattan. someplace? Ma Manhattan. Manhattan. Is in Manhattan. Manhattan. Okay. Yeah. So actually, th let's make this simple. There's 
I'll link to your website and you'll have all this stuff on your website of where, course, where yeah. you're going to be and all that. Yeah. You, you probably have some email thing where people can sign up to be notified. Yeah, yeah. Of, yeah. yeah. If, if people write <laughs> on the email of my website, that is info at my name, shaktikaterinamanji.com. Mm -hmm. Like we send all information, but okay. yeah. So uh, I, I want I'll, I'll put a page up on BatGap with all that linking to that. Thank you. And also, there's a thing on BathGap under, I believe it's the resources menu, where we have a geographic index, where if, if somebody what? types in Seattle, for instance, they, they automatically quickly see what's going on among all the oh. people I've interviewed so far in the Seattle area, and then it radiates out by distance. So you might see five miles away, 50 miles away, ah, 100 miles away. Cool. So we'll send you information to register for that, and if people hadn't heard of that, they might want to check it out. That, that's very cool. Really, I like it. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, it's really been a delight speaking with you and also listening to your talks in preparation for this. And I uh, feel like I've made a nice new friend, even though she doesn't exist. And <laughs> <laughs> yes, I feel the same. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you in October. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Okay. And and thanks, thanks to those who've been listening or watching. What yes, were you going to say? Were you going to say something else? No, just like that has been really nice to speak, really delightful, and that uh, I'm really happy to be here and to meet uh, all these new friends. Good. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Namaste. Be well. Namaste. <laughs>